it started with very very small steps they weren't particularly significant i've had plenty of setbacks along the way but um I wasn't prepared to just go, oh, well, I haven't been an instant success, let's quit. I've kept on at it and developed stuff over time. Influencing the thinking of billions of people every year. They are the thought leaders, educators and extroverts. Meet the minds behind the microphones. The experts who share from the stage, encouraging us to think differently do more and strive to succeed. Welcome to the Hashtag Keynote Speaker Show. Welcome to episode two of Hashtag Keynote Speaker. Today, a very special guest from the other side of the globe. If you watched episode one, you already know who this is. Rick Russian has done me a massive favor by introducing me to this guy who doesn't just have one, two, or three best-selling books. Believe it or not, this guy has 11 best sellers. Now, if you're in Australia, they are in all the best bookshops. I even found these two only yesterday, perched right on the counter at Officeworks. Incredible. So please welcome the one and only Paul McGee, the sumo guy. Paul, welcome to Hashtag Keynote Speaker. Jonathan, that's an amazing introduction. That really, I'll tell you, I'm feeling motivated just listening to you introduce me. Well, you are a massive, massive influence. And anyone who's a friend of Rick Rushton's um, deserves being checked out because that guy is 100% <laughs> solid. What, from a, from a criminal background, you no, mean? No, Rick Rushton, I would put Rick Rushton in my top five, 100%. He has been amazing for me on my journey uh, into the speaking world, a career change. Some people say a midlife crisis, but uh, the, the switch. And uh, when he introduced me to you and your work, and I actually heard you on the Voices of Value podcast. And, right. Um, I was fascinated. I just, you know, I think it's incredible and you can agree with me or, or, or offer your advice. And I don't mind if you, if you have a different opinion here, let's put it out there. Mm. But someone who has been around the world and talks on the same or similar topic for as many years as you have uh, is testament to your ability to really understand a topic. And I think uh, you need to be congratulated for your work and the amount of people you have influenced since when did you start speaking? It was well before 2012. So. Yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's quite a backstory. But the, going back to Rick for a moment, I think one of the big lessons, and it's for all those listening, is that life is a team sport. And, um, you know, Rick has been a huge help to me both in, in business, but also as a friend. So um, and, it, and it is it's it can be a lonely journey as a speaker sometimes. But um, sometimes you come across some real gems in life in the in, in the likes of, of Rick and others. So uh, that's just one of the key things I think is a piece of advice straight away is, um, you know, appreciate the support you get from other people and realize, though a lot of it is down to us, what we achieve you cannot ultimately achieve it without the support of other people. And Rick is very much a cheerleader in my camp, and hopefully I am for him as well. I think he is, and I think uh, I think you two are a great pair. So I'm very, very honoured to have you on the show. Um, if you don't know, Hashtag Keynote Speaker is all about getting to know the people who have the greatest influence on stage and getting to know your backstory. When did you get into speaking, or did you think that speaking and consulting and and, and training teams would be a career that you could follow and survive in, in, in many respects you know when you when you're a kid at school i mean i liked drama i was good at english um i was probably average at all sports um and you don't think at school well i'm, I'm gonna you know maybe one day i'll be a motivational speaker um I, but i did have an interest in people and i did a degree which incorporated behavioral and social psychology worked um, and trained worked as a probation officer working with criminals decided after i graduated i didn't want to go down the route of of kind of like working with criminals because i felt most of my degree and my degree was back in the 1980s we we basically spent a lot of our time looking at the psychology of failure and why people don't thrive and flourish in life um but i got into hr worked for unilever big multinational 
and uh, we're one of their companies, Bird's Eye Walls. And um, I suppose one of the things I always say is I learned, uh, one of my experiences was I had to manage 30 women in the factory who made the cheap beef burgers. And my two main lessons were, number one, don't eat cheap beef burgers. And, and secondly, when arrogance meets ignorance, that's a really dangerous cocktail. And I think in some ways I thought, well, I've got my degree. You know, I'd studied for four years that degree. I'm now in this, you know, high-flying graduate management role. Then, then this should just be really easy. And those 30 women taught me that actually, in many ways, I felt I'd learned nothing at university at all. But my big pivotal life-changing moment Jonathan was when I actually became ill with I think you call it in Australia chronic fatigue syndrome Um, and I was ill for over three years and by the time I felt I could maybe work again um, and I just basically said goodbye to having a high-flying job and even maybe a full-time job so I tried to get something maybe just part-time any any basic job just to kind of not so much just bring in some income but bring in some dignity back into my life having been literally labeled an invalid for over three years um unfortunately i couldn't get a job doing anything so it was actually back in 1991 i hired myself i was amazing at the interview standout candidate (laughs) and um it's been a long journey this is now you know this will be my in in march of this year 2020 i will i will have been in business 29 years and um it started very very small in in financial terms my first year of business, I turned over, well, in, in, in pound sterling, I turned over just over £2,000. I earned so little that my uh, I paid no what we call any national insurance in the UK. I paid no tax. And actually, my accountant sacked me. It was like, I'm a waste of time. So my journey started back in 91. Um, it's evolved since then, often in some small steps, but it was probably... Yeah, in in this century, like 2002, 2003, when, um, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, I came across this phrase, sumo, which I started to use in my training sessions. And then things kind of evolved and opportunities arose to um, start speaking at conferences. So that's a bit about my backstory. It was almost a happy accident as to how I got into doing what I'm doing, really, and almost out of necessity. It's incredible to think that you dealt with something like chronic fatigue which lasted for so long, but you're still able to pull yourself up off the mat. You might, what was going through your mind at the time? I mean, if you're going out and training and, 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 and teaching people, is that what you're doing straight after the three years? What happened was, um, yeah, basically, I mean, after those three years, I thought maybe I could be well enough, as I say, to do something part time. And, um, I worked and I had to go self-employed so I could manage my own time and my own energy. And although I felt well enough to to work after three years, it was a bit like whilst I was ill, it was like having your mobile phone, which you charged at night. And when you woke up in the morning, it was still on only 5%. Mm. When I got to the point where I charged my phone, wake up in the morning and it was at maybe 25% and I'd gone into like maybe out the red into the green, I started to do a little bit of work. And my constant fear, and I do use that word, I suppose, deliberately, is the nature of the illness was I would improve and then relapse, improve and relapse. So even when I started to really get established, there was always this concern that I would actually relapse. But I suppose I am by nature, maybe it's in my genes, maybe it's part of my mother's influence. I'm a fairly focused and driven individual. And it was still small steps, Jonathan. I mean, I worked with the uh, the Dale Carnegie organization to begin with. Then I was in in the um, in the nineties in the in the UK. We were closing down coal mines, and all the miners who'd been made redundant needed help with CVs, interview techniques, and how to sell themselves. So I won a, um, a a contract to help work with redundant coal miners. And the thing is, what had happened during my illness is I'd gone into personal development. I'd always seen it as a bit wacky and a bit American, and I've ignored it. But someone let me in a set of, this ages me, a set of cassette tapes. And I started to listen to them and thought, maybe there is some life wisdom here that could help me. And I became almost like a self-help junkie. And I'd be going to appointments to talk about, you know, providing some training. Um, I'd be doing um, after-dinner talks 
all around the country for free of charge. They wouldn't even pay me my petrol. But I had to, you know, I was starting literally at ground zero. But as I'm driving to these places, I am literally feeding my mind on, you know, the likes of Zig Ziglar and, and Jim Rohn and Anthony Robbins and just getting some, I suppose, nourishment and vitamins for my mind. And I found that hugely inspiring. And eventually I was earning a bit more than £2,300 a year. Um, and, and, you know, it's a, it's a question sometimes, Jonathan, of you, you push doors and some of them open, um, some of them don't, some of them maybe open at a later date. But I just had a real passion for personal development. I realized that was impacting me and I just want to share that passion with other people. It's just incredible to think that 1991, I won't tell you what I was doing in 1991, but there was no internet. Oh, and, that's right. And, and, and young adults, teenagers, uh, you know, corporates who are corporate workers who are now hopping out and going out on their own to chase the entrepreneurial dream, they can access all that information the click of a button on the internet. You would have been ordering cassette tapes not knowing whether they were even going to show up in six to eight weeks. Yeah, I mean, it's what we, 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 the thing is now we can be bloated with so much information, but we're still starving for wisdom in some respects. And there are so many things we, that we now have easy access to. And my challenge is to say to people, you know, don't take what you've got for granted. You know, I go, I, I'm still feeding my mind now. I'm very much, um, you know, a podcast consumer. And you mentioned um, Rick and, and Peter Kacos's uh, Voices of Value, which I recommend people subscribe to if they don't already. And I'm just constantly wanting to feed my mind. But um, I was doing that back in the, in the early and mid 1990s as well, when other people People weren't. And when I was on this project, um, helping people who made redundant when I was when I was then uh, on lunch, I'd be I'd be reading some books and I just it gave me the edge. The hunger gave me the edge. And maybe maybe that little bit of an ability at school when I was pretty good at drama starting to mix my content with maybe my love of telling stories and even acting out and performing. And it has taken a long time. I mean, yeah, written 11 books and I'm writing two in 2020. And I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people I've spoken to. I've actually worked with, with Dr. Stephen Covey when he was alive um, over in Sydney. And, and these are all amazing stories. But I just have to emphasize again, it, 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 it started with very, very small steps. They weren't particularly significant. I've had plenty of setbacks along the way. But um, I wasn't prepared to just go, oh, well, I haven't been an instant success. Let's quit. I've kept on at it and developed stuff over time. How big a problem do you think that is in society today? And, and this show is focused on keynote speakers, and there are so many people who want to hit the stage and, and do TEDx and do you know all the big shows, South by Southwest. They, they just want to go straight to the top, and they're not prepared uh, to do the time. How do you think that, um, I suppose, societal expectation is affecting people? I think we can have at times unrealistic expectations. And, and, and I wonder whether other motivational speakers can sometimes fuel that. You know, we can stand, you know, I could easily stand up on stage and, and I'm like, I'm on chapter, if you like, if you think about I became self-employed in 1991. And all right, I didn't really start doing many keynote talks until probably 2005 and beyond but you know if i'm not careful i can stand up on stage and other people kind of go you know you can you know if you believe it you can do it you know you can be where i am and it's like well we're all on our own unique journeys aren't we and um it's interesting if i'm i'm into my um my football or my soccer over here in the uk but you don't get someone who goes you know what i've just seen these players and they earn all this money i'm going to be a professional footballer you realize that it's about talent it's about hard work it's about a lot of other things about being coached and I, but but I do think sometimes people think because I can string a few words together and I've got a story then I'm going to be a keynote speaker and I'll be on stage instantly you know when I work with with Dr Stephen Covey um 
what a lot of people wouldn't know is that when I was I spoke at Eric, the big real estate conference, but at the time, um, the, what opened that door was I'd written the sumo book. And I think it's fair to say that I was flown out to Australia. And though my expenses were covered, I didn't get much more money because they'd spent most of their budget on Dr. Stephen Covey. But it was an opportunity to you know, that I wanted to grasp. And it wasn't about the finances. It was about an amazing opportunity. And obviously to sort of like meet and then uh, share the stage with Dr. Stephen Covey. But, you know, th that was probably back in around about 2006, 2007. Well, you know, I'd already been in business since 1991. So I think sometimes what happens in society is we, we see somebody's glory, if you like, but we sometimes fail to appreciate behind someone's glory there's normally a story and, and that story for most people isn't an instant overnight success but it's been years of, of hard work of focus and and working hard on yourself and as um i know rick was mentored by by jim Rohn, but i think one of the quotes from jim Rohn that i listened to when i was listening to those audio cassette tapes was you know work hard on your job but work harder on yourself and I worked hard on myself and um, I think it was, um, you know, as an actor who once said, you know, it's taken me 23 years to become an overnight success. And, and I think I'm not saying it's going to take people that long, but I, you know, I was working, doing workshops for redundant coal miners mm -hmm. who'd, you know, and they may have groups of, say, 12 people in the room. And um, most of them didn't even want to take any notes or anything. And we're only there for the free lunch. Mm -hmm. But I managed to craft um, material and engage them and make them laugh. And when I might be on stage now speaking for the likes of, I don't know, for Harrods and for Shell. And later on today, I'm doing, I'm, I've got a meeting at Manchester City. It's like, whoa this is all glamorous yeah but just remember i was working in stoke-on-trent in the early 90s with a group of blokes who'd been in a pit for 20 years who were not used to sitting in a classroom environment and they were on a two-day workshop with me and 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 that's that's where i was winning really and that's where i was developing my skills not what people see now on the big stage i was doing it on the small stage in the shadows how many, how many of those coal miners do you reckon have bought one of your books? <laughs> well, my first book was actually on CV writing back in the back in the mid nineteen nineties. But in all honesty, a great I have no idea. Write a great CV, I think it was called. That that's right, that's right, and. Um, but who knows, maybe some of their, um, if they haven't read any of the books, maybe some of their, their kids have got on to read some of the books. Because in many ways, it was only in 2005 when my Sumo book came out. And by then I'd already written, I think, four books. But 2005 when Sumo came out, that became the, um, yeah, that was a bit of a watershed moment for me because it got high profile in some bookstores. People started to read it and talk about it. It became a bit of a catchphrase. Um, the England Rugby Union coach, Sir Clive Woodward, um, or the former England Rugby Union coach, Sir Clive Woodward, who um, I won't tell you, but won't go into the details. But I think England have won only one World Cup, but I can't remember who it was against the final or where it was. But hey ho, um, don't want to upset anybody. But you know, I, he ended up Australia. reading the book. As well. It was Australia, wasn't it? Well, yeah, all right. Yeah. But I don't. I want to. I'm trying to win friends and influence I think people I was here, actually, Jonathan. I think I was actually at that game. But not as yeah. not being a rugby fan, I don't. I, it doesn't worry me too much. I'll, All right, well that's good. But, but you can talk but, about that. But you know, influential people started to read the book and mention it as well. But again, that was in in two thousand and five, and that's when opportunities started to occur. But again, what people don't always realise is, oh, I want to write a book. I want to write a book. Awesome, go for it. Um, but but you know, I I, I would craft ideas and wrestle with stuff and i was writing it i still to this day do not type up my books i i've got my pen i've got my piece of paper uh, this morning at 5 a.m in my office i am writing away uh longhand and um i'd be there on my kitchen table in my in my home 
getting these ideas and then I'd, I'd write two or three chapters and then I'd send them to three or four different friends and they'd give me feedback. And, um, you know, again, it's not, oh, you're just an amazing writer. You know, I, no one's ever taught me to write. I've just self-taught and I've also just wanted to get other people's feedback. And I think one of my key messages is <clears throat> I feel privileged to do what I do and it is amazing and I get many, many opportunities but please never, ever, ever underestimate the importance of hard work. It's it's just part and parcel of it. It really is. Now, I'm not sure if you've caught up with the news before you went to bed last night or this morning when you woke up, the tragic news about Kobe Bryant. Yes, I did. I Terrible. did. I just briefly heard about it, yeah. Uh, and that was one of his mantras. You know, if you're going to go somewhere and do something, make sure you squeeze all of the juice out of the orange. You know, he, I, I think he's right. going along the lines of he was talented, you know, he had basketball skills, but he still made sure that he squeezed all the juice out of the orange. And um, yeah, it was something I was talking to my two kids about. I've got two daughters, and one of them is going yeah. into high school this week, and yeah. she's going to a nice high school where she wanted to go to. And it's like, you know what? It's just a building. You know, you still have to work within the walls. And um, absolutely. I think Absolutely. That's what you're and and too. there's definitely an environment <clears throat> that can help young people and anybody thrive. Yeah. And I think what I've also would say to keen, you know, to, to people who are keynote speakers or want to be keynote speakers is, is find a good environment. And what I mean by that is find good people around you. Because what my relationship with Rick is, yeah, we'll cheer each other on, but we'll be prepared to challenge each other and have honest conversations as well. But I know he's got my back. He knows I've got his. And, um, you know, again, what Rick has achieved, he's not just sat at home looking at himself in a mirror going, I'm a tiger, I'm a tiger, I can do all this. <laughs> he is out. I mean, he ran, you know, a very successful business in real estate. And um, he's, but he's also, he's got that discipline that when he's, he's spoken at events, he's then writing out the thank you letters and following up and, and also just sometimes adding value when value's not even been requested or asked for, but He's looking to serve other people's needs. And, and again, that is not by taking a passive approach to life. That is about being passionate. That is being about being proactive. And we go back to it and it's about hard work. And that analogy of squeezing the, the very all the juice out of the orange. I mean, I'm 55. I could look back now. People going, you know, I mean, I had a meeting with a financial advisor two weeks ago. And you know what? I could probably retire. Um, and, and it's like, wow, you're 55 and you could retire. I, I, yeah, but the orange, there's still a lot of juice in the orange and there's still a lot I want to do and there's still a lot of people I want to impact. So this is not about how can I how can I make my money, my fortune. It's how can I keep making a difference because I feel really passionate about what I talk about and write about. Tell us about the sumo guy and the, princi uh, the sumo book and the principles that come out of the sumo book because, it's, as you said, it was your uh, your breakthrough moment uh, your, your breakthrough uh, book. Did you write the book so that you could keep a record of it or think through it? What What was the drive behind the book? And then what are the principles in it that okay. didn't resonate? Sure. I mean, it, it, the backstory, again, just be aware of happy accidents and coincidences that seem to occur. I was actually in 2002 running a coaching and counselling skills course, again, for probably less than 10 people in Glasgow in Scotland. And at one stage, somebody said, well, if all else fails, you can always tell them to sumo. And everyone looked at this person and went, well, what do you mean? And he went, shut up, move on. And it was just like a little phrase that, that I started to weave into some of my courses and it started to resonate. And then over time, what the score was, was I was doing a lot of workshops. Some of them were, in fact, most of them were not through my own business. I was working as an associate trainer with a number of companies. But it was almost like um, I had this little smoggers board of of ideas, this little buffet of, of different concepts and ideas. And, and over time, and again, I stress it was over time. It wasn't overnight. I started to use the phrase sumo, shut up, move on as an umbrella term and start to use this phrase you know, my sumo principles. And I think, again, one of the lessons for people is you've got content, but how do you brand it and how do you package it in a way that is is accessible and, in a sense, digestible for people? But the reason for wanting to write the book was I was very aware that the, the words, although I'd written a couple some books already, but, you know, I haven't climbed Everest. 
Um, I've I haven't uh, got a gold medal. I'm not some great sports person, and you know I haven't had to overcome any sort of like f- uh, physical challenges. I haven't overcome a major illness really. I know chronic fatigue is an, an illness, but it's not like cancer. So in many respects, some of the um, the opportunities that people have to become a motivational or keynote speaker have come because of what they've achieved or what they've overcome. But for me, and there wasn't there wasn't a lot. You know, I've managed thirty women who who make cheap beef burgers. You know, I'd you know I take my kids shopping on a Saturday and try and survive that. So the the reason behind writing the book was partly from a raise your profile and increase your credibility. And I had no idea how well the book would do, but I was very – people were hearing me speak at events and going, we love this stuff. We love this stuff. And then people started to say, you should write a book. And eventually, after 13 publishers rejected it, then one publisher took a bit of a punt on it, and it did well. So it was – yeah, it's nice to have the book there as a kind of like legacy, but it, you know, I've got to be honest with you. It was about building credibility and raising profile, and again I, – and I decided not to self-publish because I thought, well, if I get a publisher, they might have that influence, be able to get it into railways and books – in bookstores and airports, and of course now what I find is you found this, um, earlier yesterday is you find I find out my books are out in Australia I mean my books are translated I think in total into about 21 different languages so um yeah and that has now in, influenced my influence has increased as a result of that so profile credibility and influence were the driving factors around writing the book how important is the book for bookings because that is an ongoing battle in speaker world is a you got to have a book, B, and then there's the whole argument about self-publishing or not self-publishing. Now, just to put some context into this, I wrote my book probably in 2014, then I rewrote it in 16, rewrote it in 17, and then the summer of 18, uh, no, summer of 19, I said I'm not touching it ever again, and I updated it, the principles are the same, and I said I'm not touching it ever again, and yeah, let's mention Rick again. He said, yeah, it's worth not touching it again. Um, but there is that battle, you know, uh, self-publish, don't self-publish. Do you need a book? Don't you need a book? There's so many different ways to go. Uh, well, those last words you've just said are absolutely crucial for everyone to take on board. There are so many different ways to go. This is not a one size fits all approach to how you build your business and develop your career. I know plenty of people who have um, who've self-published and whose garages are full of boxes and boxes and boxes of books. I am aware of one guy who self-published his book and then as a result of it selling pretty well and he was doing courses and speaking at events and selling it there, he approached the publisher who I uh, uh, published through and um, his books are doing really well. So when he started with self-published and went on to, um, you know, through a publisher. But I think the key is this. If you are wanting to develop your speaking skills in your speaking career, focus on your speaking skills and on your speaking career and recognize that it's not if I have a book then that's going to lead to success hey my book has helped me I have spoken at the 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 Covey event that happened two things happened why did I get to speak with Dr Stephen Covey in in an ARIC event in Australia uh, in in Sydney the Sydney Convention Centre for two reasons not for one but definitely for two number one someone came across a sumo book and liked the ideas and liked the material. So that opened a door. However, that's all it did. It didn't get me through the entrance of the door. What then happened was they said, look, we're interested in you speaking at this conference in Australia. However, there's a conference going on in London and we just want you to speak there first. We've, we've heard some great stuff about you, but we'd like to see you live in action. And if we think that it goes well in London, then you'll get the opportunity to go to Australia and speak with Covey. Now, the book opened a door, but it didn't get me through completely. If I'd have bombed on stage in London, 
I would never have worked with Covey and, I, and I've never would have met Rick and I'd never probably done work in Australia. So the book can help. But I know lots of speakers who are just brilliant on stage, have a relevant content who and again, it can help. It's not essential, but it can definitely help. It can make people laugh and a book. They may have a book. They might not have a book. I think we can get a little bit obsessed with a book. Rick, his profile and influence has increased because of his book. Absolutely. But he was an outstanding communicator before the book and he was developing a successful career before the book. It's enhanced it, but it's not necessarily the reason for your success. And neither are any of my books, the total reason for why I've achieved success. I think that's a great answer. Uh, do you is the message that came out of that. I I reckon uh, your own path uh, it can help for sure. Let's get into speaking. What is it that you love about speaking on stage? The um, there was a, a film called Chariots of Fire a many years ago. Classic, a classic film. Uh, and it's it, it features on, I think the guy's name was Eric Little and um, a very religious guy who, um, from it, from a faith point of view, wouldn't wouldn't race on a on a Sunday. And I think there was going to be a, a semi-final or the final of a competition that was going to take place on a Sunday. So he didn't run. He went in another event and, and, and I believe um, he, he ended up winning gold. But the reason I'm telling you that story is he uses a phrase um, and this is not about whether you're religious or not, but it but it's it's this phrase. He says, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Now, Eric Little was talking about, you know, I feel almost like God's pleasure. It's like this is why I am on this planet. This is what I was born to do. I was literally born to run. And in many respects, I have to recognize as I look at my life, I am you know, the, probably I'm in the top three in the world for the world's worst DIYer. Uh, I'm just hopeless <laughs> with making anything or fixing anything. I, I'm, I'm poor at so many things. But when I'm on stage, it's like, this is what I'm on this planet to do. I can do one-to-one -one coaching and, and I can enjoy that. And I can do intimate group workshops and that goes pretty well as well. But there are times when I'm on stage and I know my stuff and I've developed my stuff over years and I know it's helped me and I know it's helped so many other people. And when I have the privilege, which it definitely is a privilege to speak in front of an audience, whatever that size of audience is, and share some of these insights and ideas, maybe inspire people, maybe help them, not just in their work, but in their personal life. And, and maybe even make them laugh as well and maybe see things differently. I'm like, how freaking lucky am I to have found what I'm passionate about? And because of 29 years of work, I've become pretty good at. That's what I love. And don't tell any of my clients this, but there are times when I'm on stage, uh, I'm speaking to a group of people and I'm having such an amazing time. And I'm thinking, I would do this for free. But don't tell my clients that. <laughs> Don't tell anyone that. Uh, <laughs> I agree. When uh, for the the amount of times I've been on stage in the last uh, twelve months, and it all started um, with a TED talk, which is probably a great place to start. Um, yeah. Is for me, it's almost on the on the same. I, I've had sporting injuries. I I never made it to any great level in sport or achieving, but. Um, but I was a journalist on television and that's what I wanted to be from the age of 15. And I achieved that, but 2012, I fell out of love with it. But it's sort of that moment when you know you're alive. It's like a grand final mm. day. Um, yeah. And you have to perform. And this, this, you know, while I do get anxious and nervous and, and, and all those natural reactions, I, I embrace them. How do you deal with that? I mean, you've been doing it for so long. Do you still get nervous? Do you, have a pre-talk routine. Um, yeah, I still, I mean, one of the things, someone once said to me, so what motivates you? And, and my initial answer was to make a difference, which, which is true. I do want to make a difference. But, you know, if I'm really honest with you, Jonathan, what also is a bit of a motivator is don't bomb, don't fail. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good 
you know, I did three events last week. They went great. I did an event in the northeast of England on Friday. We had a ball. We just had so much fun and interaction and people buying the book. But guess what? Tomorrow, it's another day. It's another event. It's with a new audience. And, and my my mindset is it doesn't matter how well things have gone before. You, today's what counts. So I become very, very focused. Um, I, I really one of the things that can happen maybe when you've been speaking as long as Rick and I have is if you're not careful, a bit of complacency, taking things for granted can creep in. Now, I just really want to guard against that because I, I always, you know, I've wrote, I wrote a book called Self-Confidence. And um, I had a slight disagreement with my publisher because on the back cover, they wanted to put, you know, how to banish self-doubt forever. And I'm like, no, I don't think you do doubt. You don't banish self-doubt forever. Actually, a little bit of self-doubt isn't always a bad thing. It, it keeps you grounded. It keeps you humble. It keeps you focused. So maybe manage it. Don't be consumed by it. But you're never going to completely banish it. And and for me, my my. Uh, do I get nervous? I w I'd like to use the phrase, I get adrenalized. And I keep thinking about my audience and I keep thinking, you know, I am here to give of my best to serve these people. And um, that's my kind of attitude. And yes, I'm focused. And I don't go into sort of like, you know, I'm not staring in a mirror going, I'm a tiger, I'm a tiger. But I um, I like to meet delegates if I can beforehand and, and have conversations. I'm very always, always from a practical point of view, be at the venue nice and early, sound check. Uh, check the slides are okay. I sometimes even will be going to go, can we move that table? Um, or, you know, we, we've set out the room for 200 people. Yeah, that's right. How many people are you expecting? 150, but there might be a few extras. And I go, yeah, but there might not be extras. So I, I'm moving tape. Part of my, you know, say, what's your pre-speech routine? Part of it is shifting furniture <laughs> because I'm trying to create that intimacy and that environment. And I'm saying, look, maybe we'll have a few chairs at the back if there are any extras. But, then, but I said, but everyone's going to go to the back. So if you've got set up for 200, there's only 150. The first few tables are all nice and empty. That isn't good for audience engagement and intimacy and connection. So I'm, I'm actually focusing on quite a few of the practical things as well not just the psychological preparation and what is always crucial for me in any talk that I do is know your first 90 seconds really well um, and and the opening words that I'm going to say which sometimes vary depending on the audience I'm really focused on what they're going to be and then from there it kind of like it, it all starts to unfold in a, hopefully a really positive way yeah, excellent advice. That first ninety seconds, it's a similar, uh, it's a similar lesson that I teach when people make videos and coaching people to make videos. Know your first ninety seconds and know your exit. And Absolutely. If you have those two yeah. things. All the rest of the knowledge is in your brain, and it'll just yeah. uh, file out the way that you need it to file out. As long as you've done the work. You can't expect Absolutely. To just get on stage I think that's brilliant advice. Brilliant advice. And, and as I say, yeah, 90 seconds and yeah, know your clothes. It's I, I have these three G's to when you're preparing, you know, grab them, give them and goodbye. So what do you do to grab your audience and engage them straight away? What are you going to give them in terms of content that adds value? But also what is your goodbye? Yeah. And you leave them with a piece of gold, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, um, one of the concepts out of sumo is reframing failure have you got any have you got a funny story about when things didn't quite go right for a guy who's been up in front of people for so long um have you ever had moments of awkwardness that you've had to recover from and and then how did you deal with that after in in your mind and obviously early on it was bigger because you were worried about whether you were going to get chronic fatigue again and whether it was all just going to go away what you were building yeah, I think one of the things in life is, and, and sports psychology use this phrase a lot, control the controllables. So in terms of would I have another relapse, it seemed to some extent that was out of my control. But there are things where I've, have things haven't gone so well that have maybe been in my control. And I always remember early on in my, my speaking career, probably around about 2003, 2004, a guy had heard me do a talk during the day and, and found me really funny and engaging and said, I'm doing a conference for um, a group and a, a large accountancy practice 
and uh, they're after an after dinner speaker and I think you would be great and I went wonderful he said you just need to be funny and then present a few awards at the end so I drove down to Oxford during the day. I, I had dinner with a client. I was I was with the partners over dinner and they were really looking forward to hearing me speak. And um, my first 90 seconds weren't too bad. So I got the, the grab them bit OK. But then the give them, I just realized there is a bit more to being an after dinner speaker than I'd perhaps appreciated. I was road testing things that I thought would be funny, putting them together for the first time. I had waitresses were coming in during my talk, walking in front of me, topping up people's teas and coffees. People wanted to go to the toilet. People were then trying to order more drinks while I'm trying to speak. It was a nightmare. And those partners who'd sat at dinner with me and, and been really, really chatty, not a single one of them spoke to me after I did my after dinner talk. And one of my principals and I, I apologize because you did say what are some of your principles and i didn't actually tell you but one of them is um hippo time is okay what are hippos do in the mud they sometimes wallow and sometimes you to feel mad bad or sad about something is actually legit as long as it doesn't last too long and after i'd finished that after dinner talk i knew inside i was dying inside um and it was like i might not have been born in oxford but boy did i die here and um I just remember it just and because it was after dinner and it was late and I was probably 150 miles away from home that I had overnight accommodation and I was determined that the next day I would leave early um, and but I would go down for breakfast as early as soon as if breakfast was at seven on a Saturday morning. I would be there at seven because I wanted to eat my breakfast and then check out and leave as quickly as possible because I didn't want to make eye contact with anyone who'd heard me speak the day before. So it's fair to say um, that is still a, a vivid memory for me. And it's always, again, that sense of I never want to have those feelings again and do everything within your control that to influence that never happening again. Now, as it happens, have I done some after dinner talks since? Yes, I have crafted them very differently. There's always, um, I would say, you're not going to get just a comedian. It's going to be wit and wisdom. And I've not, I've not had those feelings before, but I just always recognize that, um, you know, don't ever, you know, guard against complacency. And yes, People, sometimes things don't go well and sometimes that's to do with the audience and it's nothing to do with you it's out of your control but sometimes actually no it is to do with you and I completely um, misjudged my ability to craft an after dinner talk and to bring the house down I didn't bring the house down at all I think they wanted to go home early do you think that maybe you did, it was one of the first that you'd done and you, and you hadn't asked enough questions about the environment was that the mistake that you made I think it was not so much that it was just literally I I think what, what you need to appreciate with something like this is that just because you're funny during the day and you're giving some content um, mixed with humor, that doesn't automatically mean transfer that. Oh, well, you can automatically do that after dinner when people have had a few drinks, mm. they've had the meal, they're in a different kind of mindset. So I don't think it's just that I'd not asked enough questions. I just not really thought it through enough. And in those days, I mean, we are talking a long time ago now. I'd not really got the the skill set and the competence to know how to craft content in a way that would go down really well. I still don't like doing after dinner speeches very often. I do them sometimes. They go well now. But it was actually, I think, sometimes um, – there's, a, there's a, a concept called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is that sometimes people overestimate their ability to be able to do something. And it's like, well, I'm good at speaking during the day and I can make people laugh. So how hard can it be to do that at night? And make people laugh as well and i'd overestimated my ability to be able to do that that's the dunning kruger effect it's almost the fake it till you make it philosophy isn't it which is riddled with uh risk of course uh, yeah absolutely and um you know that sometimes you know act as if and all those things can be useful but what let's just boil this down that failure 
was was a competence issue and was due to a having almost like too much self belief and too much self confidence that wasn't actually married up with competence. And that's a great lesson for everyone to be uh, adhering at the moment. I think people can see someone on stage like like yourself, like Rick, like other people that you know people admire, and they can and maybe they're looking going, how hard can it be? They stand up, they tell some stories, they make some people laugh. I can do that. Look, just be aware of the Dunning Kruger effect. Mm. You know, don't you know? Overestimate your abilities when actually you've never really tried something before. It it takes time. It take it takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of practice and refining and developing your content in such a way. I think that's a really uh, valid point for me. When I first when so I developed uh, my IP, I suppose my thinking around videos and viral videos and how all that works, um, and created a formula that measures how people will react to content. And that was all fine. And, and, and I did that in the confines of this room, which is basically the fourth bedroom in my house. And I went from an environment similar to you, I suppose, where, you know, I was in an open newsroom environment with 100 people that you could just go and interact with at any time. And then mm. turned into a sitting in this room from, say, 9 o'clock in the morning, having breaks with the family in between, but then probably not finishing till midnight and became quite isolated. But when the speaking came onto my radar, I was really resistant to it until I saw how it worked. And I spent a year going to every public speaker, keynote speaker that came to Melbourne. And just right. what from the best to the worst, from the most expensive to the cheapest. And I think that's a massive mistake that people make. And I think it sort of happens a bit with Gary Vaynerchuk because he's so popular on social media. People are like, you know Mm. what, I want to be like Gary Vaynerchuk. And then all of a sudden they Mm. get up on stage and they start to swear a bit and they get a bit of swagger and, Mm. you know, it really isn't authentic to them. And I think as an audience, if you're tuned in, you can tell when someone's communicating authentically or not. How would you advise people to make sure that they can be inspired by others, but still stay true to themselves? You know, one of the things I started off with at the beginning of our our, our conversation, Jonathan, was, you know, life is a team sport. And, And one of my piece of advice would be, you know, in both in the UK and I know in Australia, there are professional speaking associations. And I would encourage people maybe to go along to some of their meetings, meet other people, maybe get mentored by people, learn from other people and try out your material. So in the UK, I know what we could call it the Professional Speakers Association. They have these like speaker showcases yeah. and, and people get a chance not to have to do an event where they might be paid and they might bomb and their reputation is, is destroyed almost like overnight. But they have an opportunity to speak in front of fellow speakers. And I think sometimes what those other speakers can do is they can hold up a mirror to you and and they can either say, this resonates, this is good, or this doesn't kind of, it seems like you're acting, you're trying to be somebody you're not. Mm. And you are right, just like kids are really good at spotting, you know, I don't know, people who just don't seem authentic. They're never going to use that word, but... Mm. But I think adults can do it as well. I think hopefully we can we can smell out the BS and we can mm. smell out when people are putting on a complete act. You know, when Rick's on stage and when he's off stage, he doesn't change. He's, he's, he's the same Rick on and off stage. Mm-hmm. I think some people... They do change, and it's like, is that really you? And you and I f- think for me, what you get of Paul McGee on stage is a slightly more, um, you know, sometimes a slightly louder, larger, yeah. but still same version of Paul McGee as I can be when I'm chatting to my cats first thing in the morning. I'm a little bit of a quirky guy. I like to, you know, do silly things at times. I'm really, you know, um, but I'm, I'm passionate and I like, I like if I'm out with friends, having a drink, I want to tell them a story. If I can make them laugh, that's great. Well, being on stage is just a slightly more exaggerated, but still authentic um, version of what I'm like off stage. Yeah. So I think, 
two things one you know a bit of self-reflection and um, but also um you know don't, don't gary v is gary v it's like be be i know it's a cheesy phrase but you've got to be the best version of you that you can be yep. and do you know what maybe the best version that you can be is definitely as a keynote speaker but do you know what for some of your listeners you you love the opportunity you love what it could seem like you love what the glamour and the glory could seem to bring but actually sometimes being the best version of you you can be is being a coach is being a trainer is being a consultant and that's equally great you know do what you know do think about that eric little thing you want to go to work you want to do what you do and go this is what i'm on this planet to do and and for some people that is being a keynote speaker but for plenty of people it isn't and that's absolutely fine you can still have the same passion the same um desire to develop yourself and others but you sometimes express it in different ways and that's all good we're all running our own race you know once you've found your lane you know, stay in your lane and try and go for your prize yeah. rather than keep looking at what everyone else is doing in their lanes. You're called to do what you're called to do. Go for it. I agree. That's amazing advice. And, you know, and it's so simple advice. And it's almost advice that you, you know, my grandfather used to give me as a young kid. Run your own race. I had hey, well, old... do you know what? Maybe I'll old enough to be your granddad. Sean. I've been no. around a while, you know, mate. No, not quite. But, uh, you know, I had two older brothers, so I was always trying to play catch up. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's a really important thing. Just do you. That, that, that's so, so important nowadays. Um, there's, there's a phrase which I say, you know, beware the snare of compare. Yeah. And, you know, I've I've sold, I don't know, probably now a quarter of a million books o over the years. And then you can go into a bookstore and all right, you've, you've seen a couple of my books. Great. There's a very good chance lots of people go into lots of bookstores and not see my books and they won't be necessarily at number one or they won't be a business book of the month. And and sometimes I've, I can go into situations and go flipping out, you know, JK Rowling's got a lot of profile here. Where's flipping <laughs> Paul McGee, you know, bottom shelf on the second floor in the corner by the toilets. And it's like, run your race, mate. You're doing all right. It's quarter of a million. She probably sells that in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but you know what? You're running your race. You're doing your thing. And yes, you can always compare against yourself against people who aren't doing as well as you. And you can always compare yourself against people who are doing a lot better than you. I, who does it really benefit? Just be grateful. You're alive. You're on the planet. You're loving what you're doing. And, and some bookstores do happen to, you know, stock your book. Hey, wonderful. If you want to get a bit more profile like JK Rowling, you might have to get a bit spicier on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, 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 Oh, I'll tell you, I, I've got so many things in my head that don't become tweets because <laughs> I think it becomes a bit of a distraction, to be fair. So I try and I either comment a little bit about football or, or the issues around personal development or a few family things. Mm. But um, religion and politics and um, issues around gender identity, I'm, I'm just staying well clear of. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's not your boat, and you're not an expert on it. Um... You know, that's, yeah, you know, I think that's fair enough. And I think it's a smart call just because social media is there and anyone can publish anything doesn't mean you have to. I think that's a really Well, important. you know, to, just just free yourself up from the, thing, the belief that you have to have an opinion on everything. I don't have an opinion on everything. Everyone's talking in the UK about Harry and Meghan and what do I think. I'm not giving it a lot of thought. I've got my mind full of other things. Whatever I think doesn't make any real difference. But, well, haven't you read about it? What about this? What about that? Do you think we're being racist? And do you think this? And what about Harry? And I'm just like, look, lots of other people are thinking about it. Good luck to them. They're two fellow human beings. I'm kind of cheering them on. But I don't have any huge, you know, strong opinion. And it's like, really? Mm. You don't have an opinion? Mm, not really. I'm actually... Trying to write a book for teenagers is going to help them as they navigate the teenage years. I'm trying to write another book with some with another author. I'm I'm speaking at events. I'm getting us. I'm trying to win business. I'm, you know, that's what's occupying my headspace. I'm wanting to chill out with my family. I'm wanting to see if Wigan Athletic can rescue their flipping season. <laughs> um, those are what are really occupying my mind, not what's happening in the royal family. Yeah, that sort of goes back to what you said really early on. What what can you control? What can you influence? Now, talking Absolutely. about talking about your next moves. Uh, let's what what's in the future? What's in twenty twenty 
for Paul McGee, you did mention that you're, you're writing a book around teenagers, and that's a obviously, um, I think we can say, a different audience for you. Um, totally. How did that come about? And, you know, are you writing this book based on anything in particular that's happening in the world? Because I don't want to steer my question, but, you know, around me, I'm seeing a lot of middle-aged um, men particularly struggling with their mental health. I don't know whether... Mm it's a spike or whether just people are becoming more comfortable with coming out with it. And I'm Mm. also seeing a lot of teenagers who are dealing with what's being classified as broad anxiety. Uh, They're quickly being put into the ADHD or ADD sort of categories. Um, You know, and then you've got the, the, you've got the experts who are, or not so experts who are blaming it all on social media or video games. What is it? And, is this the sort of thing that you're looking at? Obviously, it has to be part of it because if you're writing a book for teenagers, these are the things that are challenging them. Sure. I think um, none of us are magically born with a set of skills to know how to to do life well. Um, I think that's the starting point. None of us, whatever our age, it's not like um, it's like just because I've got two ears and, and I can hear some sounds doesn't mean I'm now a really skilled listener. And we just pick up ideas and and you know we 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 we, our parents or the adults in our lives are our role models and some of what they teach us proves to be really helpful um but maybe some of what they teach us isn't always that helpful and so the reason for the book i i mean when i wrote sumo which you know i wrote on my kitchen table in 2004 and it came out in 2005 i actually put in the back of the book because i'd had without going into any real detail at all a massively, massively dysfunctional childhood, really off the charts in many ways. And I feel I've been unlearning as much as learning over the years and, and dealing with some yeah childhood trauma and one thing and another. Um, so when I wrote Sumo, I, I actually said I'd love to try and see how we can use Sumo in schools. And to some extent that has developed um, if any of the listeners want to check out, we have a, a website, um, sumo4schools.com, um, with, a, with a four being uh, the number four. And that is now uh, is like a not-for-profit charity um, organization, like a charity, but not quite. But it's a not-for-profit organization that is run now by a, a colleague of mine who um, ha- has a real interest – well, has a passion in sumo, but he has a passion about kids – and he saw my ideas and he started – they were being used to help children. And so he's like running that side of things now, the Sumo for Schools Foundation, giving, in a sense, children life skills for kids to last a lifetime. Now, my publisher – and this is this is driven commercially by my publisher – they, they said there's been a rise in the number of books that are being bought by not kids, but by their parents and by family members. Basically, there's been a real rise and surge in sales for books around personal development and self-help for children, particularly because now we are realizing, I mean, it's been labeled a mental health crisis. And I don't think there's time on the podcast to go into all the ins and outs of it. But, you know, when when Sumo came out in 2005, um, Facebook was just getting started amongst college students in the US. There was no Twitter. There was no Instagram. There was no WhatsApp. There were no Snapchat. Why? Because there was no iPhones. iPhones didn't come out until uh, 2007. So even in just since the Sumo book came out, our world has changed. The pace of change. And, and children are facing all kinds of different challenges that are unique to them that their parents didn't face. And I personally have always had a passion for thinking, having gone through the childhood I went through, which I realize millions of kids don't go through, but can still be in happy, secure homes, but still have their own challenges. When a teenager, though in those adolescent years, there is so much happening to them physically as they go through puberty. Um, there's so much happening to them externally as maybe they change schools. And it's like, this is not easy to na- navigate well. And it's like day to day, life can be like a game of, of, of snakes and ladders. And sometimes on you're on a square and nothing happens. The next square, you're up a ladder. The next square, you're down a snake. And, and it's like 
So how do you play the game well? Well, you can make it up as you go along. You can, or you can go, here's some ideas, here's some insights, hope you presented in a fairly fun, creative, easy, accessible way, just to give you some tools, give you some insights to help you understand yourself, what is happening to you, help you to understand even your brain. And, and I have this analogy of, um, based on Daniel Kamen's work, the book Thinking Fast and Slow. You know, we've got two brain systems, our fast brain, primitive emotional, and our slow brain, our more logical thinking brain. And, and I get people to think about this, both adults and now in the book for kids. You know, imagine your, your fast brain is like your red baseball cap. And I represent with the red baseball cap and, and the cool blue baseball cap represents you more thinking logical type of your brain well the deal is we're driven so much by our red cap in so many areas of what we do in life but particularly when you're going through the teenage years the blue cap the more logical rational part of your brain hasn't even fully matured and it might not do so until your mid-20s so given that given that we can be very emotionally driven at times, and when you're a teenager particularly, that is very, very understandable, given there's so much change going on, that whether with the social media or not, change has been going on, you know, since, we, since we've been on this planet, um, as we go through those teenage years, physically and emotionally and psychologically. So, the book is written to try and help kids stop and understand themselves a bit more and give them some tools to move on. But I hope loads of parents will dip into the book as well and other adults and teachers to kind of maybe because I think they could get an insight as well as to what is happening to our to our children. Yeah. Absolutely. So long answer, but I hope it makes a bit of sense. No, it does. It's right. You know, as I said to you, I've got two young kids and. Uh, you know, I fear the blowtorch of social media because, you know, things or, you know, mistakes. And, and when you're in your teenage years, your formative years, that's when you should be making mistakes. Yeah, that's when you should be learning um, your boundaries, what you're good at, what you're not good at. You know, I, I did that wrong. I shouldn't have said it that way. You know, those sorts mm. of things. But the problem with the world at the moment, in my opinion, is that sometimes when you make those mistakes, uh, because you you are immature, you haven't got that formative brain set up, is you can be absolutely slaughtered on social media in a way that we've never seen in history. Uh, oh, oh, totally, and 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 it can spread, can't it? The the news can spread. I mean. Young sports people, you know, think about maybe some of the, uh, you know, you'll know the names, I won't, but you could have some real successful Aussie sports um, players, tennis players, AFL, whatever. Um, and yet sometimes they're in their early 20s. They've got all that profile, all that pressure, all that publicity, um, all that money, all that fame. And guess what? The more rational thinking part of their brain, the blue cap, hasn't even fully matured or developed yet. Fast brain, jumps to conclusions, says things without thinking, reacts, is emotional. And we might say something and you kind of go, you realize that was stupid. But, you know, the world, it seems a lot of people in the world like to jump on that straight away, make that person escape go, no second chances, like to be all self-righteous in their condemnation. And... You know, and it's like, I'm not saying we should let people off, but, you know, don't, you know, maybe some people need more of a second chance and perhaps more of a, a bit of understanding and support. You know, in, in the UK, I think sometimes we see people who make stupid mistakes and we just, the, the public is baying for them to be sacked. Yeah, well, all yeah. right, but they still need some support. They need still some help, maybe a little bit of compassion, a bit of understanding. And I think maybe as adults, particularly looking at younger people and, and remember, you could be in your mid 20s before that rational part of your brain is as fully matured. This is not a reason to give people excuses for their behavior. I want to make that clear. But I do think we just need to have a little bit more understanding and awareness and try and support people a bit more and give them boundaries and, you know, particularly, I know um, West Coast Eagles, 
they now have um i think they've got a, they've got a full-time chaplain who um who works you know very closely alongside those players to support them and you think that's what we need we can't you know life is a team sport kids need it and adults need it as well yeah i think you'll find a lot of sporting clubs across australia now is that they have what they call an inclusion officer and yeah, they okay. they sit up almost up at the vice president level. And if anyone's got any beef or feel as though they've been excluded or not understood or not heard, then they've got this almost like a forum for them to be, you know, addressed. And I, you know, I think that has to be commended, particularly when you're d- dealing with kids and junior sport, because yeah, you know, they're different kids' goals are different. Yeah, you know, some kids want to play for fun, and some kids want to go to the Olympics. And you know, it's great to be able yeah. to cater for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, I, you know, my, my principles, which we haven't really talked too much about, but I talk about developing some fruity thinking. We talk about fruit being good for our body, but get, get, be clear about how we can have good conversations in our, in our heads. Cause I would say besides God, if you believe in God, the most important person you're ever going to talk to is yourself and, and adults and kids, they need sometimes a bit of a steer on to understand how to have good conversations with themselves because how we're thinking affects how we feel our emotions our actions and and ultimately our results so it is about managing your mindset and and so that's developing fruity thinking um and i do talk also about a little principle called change your t-shirt i think some people wear the t-shirt that's got the word victim on and life's unfair and and i say you know what life is at times unfair and there are genuine victims but i think sometimes both kids and adults can act very passively and just kind of go, well, there's nothing I can do about my life. It's about luck. It's about just events. And, and one of my other ideas is E plus R equals O. It's the event plus my response that influences the outcome. So I've got a lot of very, very simple ideas. There's no other way you can describe my ideas other than simple. But I, I just I think that's what people need. I think I think people engage with stuff that they realize they don't have to wrestle too hard with and then they can start to see some results and it helps them and and that's what i've been doing for years with adults and i'm really excited about hopefully not just through the sumo for schools foundation but with this new book hopefully helping young people as well yeah that's admirable of you yeah as you said you you could retire happily and move on but um you're such a wonderful thinker uh, if you're ever back in Australia, I'd love for you to sit with my kids and have a chat to them. And yeah, you know, I think it's just so important. And if you want to do any research for your book with some young girls, um, <laughs> you've got the Skype well, number so now. You, you so. just fly me out business class to Melbourne, and I'll I'll do a session for your kids for free. I'll go halves with Rick. <laughs> Paul, we've just come up on over an hour. I've taken up way more of your time than expected, but the conversation was wonderful. Uh, so many gems, so much. Uh, I got so much out of it personally. I know that the people listening to it will. So once again, thank you. I know it's early in the morning there and you've got a busy day. Um, good luck at Manchester City. I'm sure they're probably going to try and woo you over and it could be a great decision for you. Just to <laughs> see, see out the, the last 30 years of your life with a team that may have a chance of winning. Um, true but uh, thank you again mate uh, it's been an absolute pleasure of mine to have you here and thank you, um, Jonathan. Yeah, for anyone who's watching this the website's on there the sumo guy.com uh, we had the website up for sumo for schools.com it's something that I think all schools across the world need uh, I think the world needs more of Paul McGee and if 11 books aren't enough let us know when 12 and 13 come out and uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, to help push those out for you because uh, I'm in debt to you right now because that was a great one hour. You know, I could go for another two or three hours talking to you like this. But all right, I understand. Jonathan, I, I really, you know, I thank thanks for the opportunity, and I look forward. You know, Melbourne's one of my favourite cities. Obviously, Rick lives out in that area as well, so um, I look forward to. Um, being back at some stage and maybe over a beer or a coffee, chatting a bit more and giving a signed copy of the kids book to your daughters as well. I'd love it. So now, thank you. Now, before we go, I'd nearly forgot this. I don't know if you know, but part of my talking is all about viral content and how to create content that triggers people to share a physical mm. response. So and in an ode to my own research and my own topics, uh, I weave it into this podcast, vodcast by letting the guests choose the next guest 
But the proviso okay. is, is that you also have to help me. You can't just say, you know, go and speak to Richard Branson. So what I'm trying to track with this, with this show almost as an experiment is we started with interviewee one, where can we end up in a year's time? So would you have anyone after this experience, I don't know whether you're rating it positive or negative at this stage, but I think you had a good time. Have you got someone in mm -hmm. mind that you think would be good for this show that we could speak to? I do. I do. It'll be a, it'll be a fellow Brit. Um, he also struggles with the football team he supports. It's <laughs> Everton. Um, and he's a guy called Drew Povey, who, who's been actually a head teacher um, on a, on a, in a school, one of the most poor performing schools in in the UK ended up being a star of a, of a TV show over here called Educating Greater Manchester. He's now um, a leadership speaker and also does quite a lot in the in the world of sport uh, with elite athletes. He would be um, a, a great person awesome. to speak to and I'll um, I'll be very happy to uh, recommend him. That'd be great. Thank you Paul. I, uh, that sounds awesome right up my alley. Uh, great thanks again good luck with the two books good luck with your meetings today and all the events and and, and the rest of 2020 uh please don't retire anytime soon because i think you've still got so much to give and all uh, right appreciate that thank you mate. i think my, my wife might disagree but i I'm, I'm sticking with what i know i love doing well she, you know you know she has to be careful what she wishes for because if you retire you're going to be home a lot more and she might not know, like that as much as she that. thinks she's going to like it exactly no you're dead right okay and all the best to you and your family as well jonathan look thank forward to meeting them sometime thank you paul there you go paul thank mcgee you. Take care. the sumo guy cheers